Hi, welcome back to the Word of Migration, the podcast from the Migration Policy Institute that delves into interesting topic on immigration, immigrant integration, and humanitarian protection with some of the world big thinkers and policymakers. My name is Camilo Goz and I'm your host today and an associate director at the Migration Policy Institute Europe. And in this episode, we'll take a dive into documentation and kinship two topics that may not seem to be related, and yet there are some fascinating linkage that we'll be discussing today. And I'm delighted to be joined by Apostolos Andrikopoulos to discuss all of this issue. Apostolos is a Marie Curie Global Fellow at Harvard University and the University of Amsterdam. He recently published his book, Argonauts of West Africa, an authorized migration and kinship dynamic in a changing Europe with the University of Chicago Press. His books provide an ethnographic exploration of how unauthorized migrants in Europe turn to kinship to address challenges related to their legal status. For those interested in the question of undocumented migration, this book offers a fresh and original perspective by highlighting the stories of migrants and their struggle and showing the pivotal role of kinship in unexpected contexts, such as the way migrants acquire documents that enable them to travel, work, and settle in Europe. Apostles, welcome. I'd like to begin our discussion by addressing a central theme in, in, of your book, and that's how certain migrants use identity documents that either belong to other lookalike migrants or have, have been made by brokers and other intermediaries. From the state point of view, these actions are typically referred to as identity fraud, but you chose not to employ this concept, this term in your book. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on your reason for this choice. I know you spend a lot of time with migrants lacking legal status in their countries of residence and that they've been sharing their perspective and thought on documentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, actually, there are uh, several reasons for this. The most important one uh, that I wanted to understand uh, these practices from the migrants' uh, point of view If I would uh, adopt uh, identity fraud as an analytic term, uh, then I would approach uh, these practices through the lens of the state. And then this means that my attention would be directed to issues that for the state are prioritized as important. And these are uh, first where these documents are produced, whether they are uh, produced by state authorities or not. And second, whether the holders of these documents uh, are the legitimate holders of these documents, according to the state's assessment. And I think that leads also to um, the way that the document, the way migrants look at this document is a little bit through a different lens and through the one This, this notion of effectiveness. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also, you know, how access to documentation shape one migratory journey. Mm -hmm. And in precisely in your book, you talk about the trajectory of Jason with a man who's left Ghana in the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and I was hoping you could tell us about his journey and the different identities that he's taken to get uh, to get where he wanted to go. Yeah, actually, for uh, for migrants, what makes uh, uh, documents uh, valuable uh, is their effectiveness. So whether they can enable them to uh, to travel and to find work in Europe uh, or elsewhere. So this decision not to use identity fraud as uh, as an analytic term uh, is actually uh, an outcome of a discussion that I had with Jason, the person that uh, that you mentioned. That for our listeners, uh, Jason is a man from Ghana uh, who has traveled uh, through many countries, really, really many countries, uh, until he, um, in order to travel to what he said, to an advanced country, uh, and he used uh, more than 10 identities and more of Uh, six different uh, nationalities. So you said he started in Ghana, and then mm -hmm. where, where did he go from there? And, and with what? which one of these identity? Yeah. Uh, so his journey is actually quite complex. First, he started from Ghana. He traveled to Zimbabwe. From Zimbabwe, he crossed uh, the border to, to South Africa. 
uh, from South Africa, he attempted to travel to the UK, but that was unsuccessful. From South Africa, he traveled to, uh, to Malaysia. From Malaysia, he attempted to travel to, to Canada, but that was unsuccessful. He was deported back to, uh, to South Africa. Uh, and after a few years of staying in South Africa, uh, he traveled to East Africa, to, to Tanzania. And from Tanzania, he traveled to, he, he finally managed to, to travel to Europe. And, and through all these different, these different legs, these many legs of, of his journey, um, what type of documentation was he using? Yeah, well, he was using uh, passports of, uh, of different nationalities, passports that he got from, from intermediaries, from, uh, from brokers. Sometimes these passports uh, um, enabled him to travel, most of the times actually, and sometimes not. Um, such as, uh, as I mentioned, like his attempt to, to travel to, to the UK or his attempt to travel to, to Canada. But here I, I want also to stress that his very first uh, travel experience was, uh, was traveling with his own passport, with his Ghanaian passport from Ghana to Zimbabwe. And uh, he, was, uh, he was actually treated with, uh, with suspicion and doubt when he arrived in, in Zimbabwe. And he was not, uh, and the, uh, the immigration officer was uh, doubted whether uh, his Ghanaian passport actually belonged to him. So he had to, uh, he had to bribe the, uh, the officer in order to, uh, to allow him entry in, uh, uh, in the country. That really shows all the ambiguities on, on documentation and, you know, how you constantly, how in border, in different border posting, you mm -hmm. constantly uh, try to assess whether these are the right document, these, um, these are, are legal and, and, you know, are with, with the right person. And I also want to move to, to the concept of kinship, which is really another key dimension that you explore in your research, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, for some European policymakers or their stakeholder um, tend to see kinship in Africa as a traditional form of organizing society. And, and it also strikes me that, you know, working with development agency, how we always tend to refer to communities when it comes to people living in a non-Western context, like program benefit local communities, um, whereas your research has precisely shown how actually obstacle to mobility have triggered a new form of kinship. Could you tell us more about, about this? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, actually, this is a very well-rooted assumption uh, that um, African societies are uh, uh, kinship-oriented. Always in, we say that in contrast, uh, or it, always this is said in contrast with uh, Euro-American societies that are seen as, uh, as individualistic. Uh, and actually, that was uh, that was the reason that in the beginning I did not want to to study kinship uh, because I was afraid that I would reproduce the same assumption when I was studying with uh, with African migrants and then I was focusing on uh, on their kinship practices. Uh, this assumption is um, that in societies with no state organization or with weak state organization, people have to rely on, uh, on their social relations uh, to access certain resources. And when the state comes um, with citizenship, that citizenship um, uh, ensures uh, an equal treatment. Um, so people, the assumption is that people, um, in a way, become emancipated, get emancipated from uh, from kinship, from their reliance on social relations. But actually, but it's what a that, bit more complicated. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, actually, that was my um, uh, my first observation was that kinship was becoming important or was important not in the absence of the state for African migrants, uh, but um, due to, um, uh, to states, to, to the violence that they faced by the state, due to the exclusion that they faced by the state. Citizenship is, uh, is not about equality. It is also about, uh, uh, about exclusion. It is as much about exclusion as it is about 
inclusion. And um, yeah, in my in my book, actually, I explore how kinship becomes relevant, how kinship becomes important. These moments that people want to travel and they cannot travel, uh, they want to um, they want to work and then they do not have the right to work, and how in this context they turn to um, to kinship relations for assistance. And I think that there's another another key issue to think about. Um, I think when when we think about this relationship to kinship to documentation, mm-hmm. is when migrants travel under another identity um, mm-hmm. and may lose their life during their journey. Um, what what happens? Yeah, actually, this is like a very uh, yeah very sad and difficult uh, a difficult situation. I mentioned already the story of uh, of Jason, so. I think it, it is clear that migrants may take very intricate uh, trajectories. They may pass through so many different countries and they may have like um, even like unexpected trajectories. Uh, the, uh, they may travel to countries that was not originally meant to travel. Uh, very often their uh, family members in their countries of origin are not even aware about uh, uh, about these very complex routes, and when they travel uh, without uh, without documents, and if something uh, something happens on the way, like if they lose their life, then it becomes very difficult to um, it becomes very difficult to be traced. Yeah, and 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 I will had I, I think some of these routes have, have also become even more complicated because Jason's story we said dates from from the nineties and now we've seen more technology, more border management procedures that mm-hmm. uh, that have made it, especially with the systematization of of biometric border control, that can make it even more difficult to borrow one's identity. Mm-hmm. Um, from your previous research. To what extent has this changed its practices, the relation to documentation, and also the risk um, that migrants are, are have to take? Yeah, um, no, certainly, like the introduction of uh, of biometric techniques in immigration control uh, has changed uh, a lot. Uh, it is now uh, much more difficult for someone to, uh, for a migrant to use uh, the identity documents of um, of another lookalike person. Uh, nevertheless, n- not impossible. Uh, but I would say that this uh, biometric uh, uh, that biometric I- I- identification uh, has neither replaced not uh, not erased. Um, the social person, the person as a social being, remains still at the center of um, uh, of immigration of immigration control. Um, so the way that uh, migrants uh, establish uh, relations to access uh, documents, to 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 certain extent, remains uh, remains similar. Uh, so even if they would not borrow the documents of another person. They may still create a new subjectivity. Um, they may use uh, other documents, like, for example, a counterfeit uh, birth certificate to obtain a passport under a different name or with a different age, or a visa by using like uh, an inflated uh, bank statement or or a diploma. And, and precisely on that, because we, we've talked about this migration journeys, um, and I'd now like to turn to what happened to migrants who don't have legal status when they get to Europe and where they try to, to find a job. In some country, like in the United States or in France, we often talk about migrants when working under alias um, mm-hmm. without employers knowing or even trying to know. Um, there were recently a few stories in France about migrant workers who've been borrowing identity paper to work in, in all the construction sites ahead of the Olympic Games. But in the Netherlands, you, you, you explained that this practice has actually declined. What, what has happened? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, if you if you would ask this question to uh, to Dutch immigration authorities, probably uh, the answer you will get is that the practice declined uh, after 2005, when the Dutch government introduced a quite hefty fine on employers 
uh, who uh, who employed uh, unauthorized migrant workers. Uh, and, it's, yeah. it's moving the pressure. It's it's moving yeah. the control towards the employers themselves. Yeah, exactly. In in a way, you can say that it privatizes uh, migration control to uh, to a certain extent. That uh, employers uh, uh, become in charge of operating uh, migration control. And I think that the question that we need to ask here is in whose interest they operate uh, migration control. So in, uh, in the Dutch case, like the cases of, uh, of people, of workers um, uh, using someone else's identity documents uh, has changed. Uh, and uh, so, as I said, like IND may interpret that as, as a success of shifting the responsibility to employers. But we need also to take into consideration that this practice, the practice of working under someone else's documents, proliferated in a period of uh, where the Dutch economy uh, was growing, where more workers uh, were needed. This growth of the Dutch economy uh, came uh, has been halted, especially after after two thousand nine, after the the global financial crisis, and furthermore, um, there is. Uh, uh, after 2007, um, there is an increasing presence of, uh, uh, of Eastern European uh, migrant workers uh, who, uh, who are European citizens and they have full uh, employment rights. But, yeah. but, but then I have a question because mm-hmm. all of these migrants were, were still there. And mm-hmm. so if they were not working under alias... How, mm-hmm. how did they manage to find employment in, in the Netherlands? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You mean about uh, uh, African migrants who were previously working under... Yeah, exactly, uh, yeah. because they were they were still there and I assume more people were still coming despite um, yeah. the difference in the economy. Yeah, now to a significant extent they have been, uh, they have been displaced uh, by uh, Eastern and Southern European uh, uh, migrant workers. So certainly um, they face more difficulties to, to earn their living. It is, it is much more difficult. Um, they feel more the pressure of finding other ways of, uh, of getting legalized. Um, some of them, for example, if they are already in relationships, they may feel like the pressure uh, of getting married in order to uh, to get papers and then to find uh, uh, to find work and earn their living, um, and also there is a, there is a segment of uh, uh, of those unauthorized migrants who uh, who engage in uh, in criminal activities for which we do not need uh, uh, identity documents, like for example small scale um, drug trade. Uh, but I'm truly lacking uh, uh, um, more detailed information about this. It, it, and, I, and I want to go back a little bit on, on the notion of kinship and, and also relationship, because you show in your book that this relationship around documentation are extremely complex. Like this is about solidarity, support network with a, within diaspora groups. Mm-hmm. But it's it's not only about that or it's not always about that. Yeah, sure. Like using the documents of another person entails dangers and risks. And often migrants are aware of these risks, but there are always unanticipated, unanticipated consequences. So, for example, there are very often disputes about, uh, disputes about the payment. Or like, how can you be sure that um, uh, when you work someone uh, under someone else's name, that means that your salary is paid to the account of that person? How can you be sure that uh, that you will receive your salary or yeah. their great percentage? And a person might also be concerned to lend their do- the identity exactly. document, if, exactly. even yeah. if they're a relative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, social proximity is not uh, um, does not necessarily provide security. Uh, that is what uh, uh, 
what some migrants may have believed in the beginning, that they thought that uh, when they use documents from uh, from persons who are close to them, uh, that would help them to to avoid certain problems and uh, and challenges. Uh, but this is not often the case, and also when uh, when there are such problems, like for example. Um, uh, arguments about uh, how they divide uh, how they divide the salary or uh, doubts about how um, the documents are used by the unauthorized yeah, migrant uh, worker that can also have effect on uh, on the pre-existing relationship so it's yeah. not only yeah it can make things worse also so it's it's not that simple it's it's yeah it comes with with a lot of potential complication and and I thought there was a concept um that you use in your book that that was very interesting it's this notion of of abusa mm-hmm. can you tell us you know to what that refers to historically and how it came to be relevant in in the dutch context uh where where you were conducting your research mm-hmm. yeah well abusa actually is a key word it is uh, um a word it's a language that is spoken in in Ghana and it refers literally it remer, it 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 means in three parts uh, and it is a term that is associated with uh, a very popular crop sharing arrangement in Ghana uh, that is common that is especially common in uh, uh, in the cultivation of uh, of cocoa uh, and many migrants, many Ghanaian migrants in Europe actually originate from uh, uh, from these regions, from cocoa producing regions in in Ghana. Uh, so this crop sharing arrangement is um, that uh, landowners uh, uh, give their land to uh, to farm workers. Usually, these are um, migrant farm workers who take full responsibility of uh, the cultivation of cocoa and in exchange they they provide the they provide the landowners with uh, one third of the production so instead of rent or instead of uh, financial remuneration there is a, a, a kind of payment of one third of the production and so in the dutch context what what did it came to to mean yeah so um this word, this term in the Netherlands, but also in other European countries, came to describe uh, the practice of loaning of identity documents. Uh, and perhaps here an explanation for that is that the common arrangement is that uh, uh, one third of, uh, of the salary earned goes to the person who... Um, uh, to whom the document belongs to. So usually the salary is divided in three parts and two parts go to the person who has actually worked for that money. Done the work. Yeah, to the uh, unauthorized migrant worker and uh, one third goes to uh, to the person who owns the document. That's that's fascinating. And now I want to move to a very sensitive topic, um, which is the one of return. Mm-hmm. Um, we often hear from policymakers um, that you know their objective is to increase um, the return return rates. And, and in your book, you precisely mentioned several cases of unauthorized migrants who were arrested by authority and subsequently had to forcibly return to their country of origin. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering, you know, how has their return been perceived, um, especially in the context of West Africa? And did you get a sense that? This discourage others uh, from trying to pursue similar migration routes and and method methods in a way. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that uh, it discourages others from pursuing uh, uh, migration projects or from uh, wanting to migrate to Europe. Uh, actually, how someone returns, like from the from the perspective of the country of origin. Uh, how someone returns, whether someone is deported or not, is not so much relevant. What is relevant is whether someone returns empty-handed or not, and whether when someone returns has uh, has already made some savings, whether 
this person when returns to the country of origin to to Ghana let's let's take that example whether this person is in a capacity to uh, to redistribute this uh, but, this wealth yeah a bit like in the case of Jason right yeah exactly yeah and but there are also many many others um, and even people who uh, who did not manage to have savings uh, usually when when they returned to the country of origin um, they return with knowledge and they return also with social capital with social networks that are also important for um, for establishing themselves for for example like establishing uh, a company that would engage in transnational trade you know to, to give you to give you an example of course there are not all of those success stories but i'm saying no. that deportation does not uh, uh, that does not necessarily mean um, shame does not necessarily mean uh, yeah a negative example for uh, for others exactly it's a, it's a much more nuanced picture that i mm -hmm. think the one we, we that, that is sometime uh, conveyed and but but i still think what we've seen you know both in the migration journey and and when people are staying in europe using you know um, identity even if these are those are lended by by relative um, we're still seeing that migrants face many many of many vulnerability many many issues mm -hmm. um, and so to conclude i'd like to us to think a bit about how the situation could be managed differently mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a difficult question. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would say that especially for those who design uh, migration policies, uh, it is important to uh, it is important to realize that uh, the state is only one of uh, of the authorities of the entities that regulates mobility uh, the state has the capacity uh, to uh, uh, to determine what is a legal and illegal form of migration but it's just one dimension exactly as you, as you say yeah. there are also other regulatory authorities of mobility such as uh, the family or kinship more generally uh, and their market and uh, all these ent entities have their own um, their own considerations in how they regulate uh, mobility. And, and a, a last point is, you know, one area you've also been thinking about is how assuming a different identity for extended period of time can have long term effect on on a person. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and this is not only uh, when someone uses an identity, a certain identity for uh, for an extended period. Uh, as I said, like this is a practice that uh, that has unpredictable consequences. And here I can think of like the story of one of my research participants, a Nigerian woman uh, who, uh, when she arrived uh, in Amsterdam. She started working for a very brief period uh, in a cleaning company under the name of, uh, of a Ghanaian woman. And in that company, um, through, through her work in that company, she managed to find uh, people who were interested in, uh, um, in hiring her to clean their, uh, their private homes. Yeah. Uh, so this is what she started doing. But these people met her through that formal job For that identity yes yeah. uh, and actually you know how this uh, uh, how how it works in that profession that it works with referrals that you find new uh, uh, your clients through the recommendations of of another one so uh, even though that this woman has been legalized uh, she's still known in Amsterdam, at least among like uh, uh, among her clients, as a Ghanaian woman with her Ghanaian name, and uh, it is already like twenty years that she works under that name. Because it's like the trust is associated to that identity yes. that she's been working under for for so many years. Exactly. Yeah, and when you have been introduced. Uh, to someone as um, uh, as a Ghanaian woman, then you have to stick with that and then you have to continue with this.
Well, thank you. Thank you, Apostol. This has been fascinating. And, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Word of Migration. If you enjoyed this conversation, please check out other episodes. Um, you can find Word of Migration wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please leave, leave us a review. You can find all the episodes for this and other MPI podcasts at MPI website migrationpolicy.org forward slash podcast. This episode was produced by Yusuf Hamid and made possible with help from Lisa Dixon and editorial input from Michel Bindelstadt. Our theme music is called Bright Idea by Geographer. I'm Camille Coase and thank you again for listening and see you next time.